must have took an extra lawn baptist nap today because they're slowly trickling in. So uh, we're, we're excited that uh, we're able to be here together in the house of God. And we're going to get started. We're going to take some time here tonight to uh, take uh, some testimonies. We haven't had uh, the time uh, necessarily, different stuff we've been doing to take a lot of testimony. So I do want to make sure that you give... Uh, we give you an opportunity to praise the Lord for what he has done in your life. I know there have been some, some great things that God has done. And so we want to hear about those tonight as well. Go ahead and start thinking about maybe some uh, a favorite uh, verse of a hymn that you haven't heard in a while or, or you would like to be sung tonight, and uh, we'll, we'll make sure we do that. So let's get started first. Let's turn over to hymn number 230. Let's start there, hymn 230, Glory to His Name. We'll start there tonight. If I could, let me have you stand up here. We'll get started here tonight standing up. We'll sing out this hymn, and then we'll open up in a word of prayer. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. things before? I do from time to time. Like when I am handed a microphone and it's on and I know it's not supposed to be turned on back there, but you just wonder. And I don't have a good singing voice and I just wonder if that's not what's going over the internet. Glory to his name. You know, it's like, oh my goodness. Oh, we, he's saying trust me. Trust me, okay, mm-hmm. So hopefully that won't happen. But I just love going ahead and singing from the bottom of my heart. That's what matters, amen? And we thank the Lord. Great to have you out tonight. We're missing a lot of people here. A lot were traveling, some are ill. Glad to hear some are doing better, praise the Lord. And uh, let's go ahead and have a wonderful time tonight, amen? amen. And uh, Chris is playing violin over here and appointing him out from all of our orchestra because he's only got one more week with us. And uh, so maybe we can have him play for us next week, maybe. Amen? <laughs> I guess I'm the only one who wants to, Chris, but uh, would you do it for me? So, all right, more folks are coming in. Let's go ahead and pray and just have a great time together. Amen? Amen. Lord, we thank you that we can meet together. Thank you for this time where we can also refresh our hearts on this special day of rest in you. And uh, Lord, if we take this time and dedicate it to you and consecrate our lives to you, we give you this hour of our day where we can focus one more time on your word and praise you and glorify you and just thank you for all that you're doing. Father, bring revival to our hearts, and we pray that you would uh, just bless the, the message as we study your word 
and uh, all that we do in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And let's go ahead and hear those praises tonight. And uh, there, there may be uh, fewer people among us tonight, but some are folks uh, are home watching faithfully. They're ill and uh, or shut in, cannot be here. Um, but let's be able to just praise the Lord tonight. We have a lot of kids with us tonight. Next week begins our children's music program with the bell choir. And uh, so our kids will be going back on out, won't be with us on Sunday nights. And so let's go ahead and take some of their praises tonight too. All right, kids, you ready? Can you have something right now? Be thinking it. Say, I thank God for fill in the blank. Okay. All right. Pastor Matt. All right. Let's uh, turn to 297. Let's sing a uh, verse of this chorus here. And then uh, we'll get to those prayer, prayer requests. I see the kids already itching to get going. They were all ready. So. All right. 297. Would you do me a favor? Would you grab this mic here for me? And uh, it's mic number one in the back for you guys. And uh, if you've got a testimony, go ahead and just raise your hand, and uh, we'll get that mic to you. We'll start here with Mr. Liam up front. I thank you for ready to be safe on the road and have travel today, and I thank you for ready to be safe. And I will be a big brother. Yes, he's got a lot to be thankful for. So he said he's thankful for his dad as he's a, he's a trucker on the road for all the safety. He never takes uh, for granted that safety. And he also said he's praising the Lord uh, that the Finnis family is expecting a new little one. So he's excited about that as well. I saw another. I saw a hand. I see Miss Mandy in the back. Let's get her. I think. For God, for my mommy and daddy, for our house, and for the church. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Get Miss Harvest up here. I'm thankful that I could come to church today because the, like, the rest of the family is staying home, and I'm thankful for our turkeys and for our sickness to go away. Well, we'll pray. We'll pray for the sickness to go away. I'm thankful for your turkeys, too, because they probably taste good. So, <laughs> In the back there, Micah. Mom said no. Okay. <laughs> said maybe we should think about that one. Anyone else here? Miss Nancy. I'm thankful for the video. Today, uh, uh, Phyllis came by during service, and I uh, was having a bit of dys dys dystonia, and she said, well, why don't you ever watch it on view? And I said, because I can't. I don't know how. I just do it on my phone. So eventually, we got it on, and you do not sound badly at all. In fact, it sounds beautiful. And the three boys... The three boys that say, Amen. it was fantastic that it was. On, on my TV. It, it was, was better on TV than it is on the phone. So I'm thankful, Praise the Lord. thankful for that. Amen. We are thankful for the technology that uh, is around that we can use and have uh, the, as a tool of our church. If you uh, don't realize it's there and you're not able to be here ever on a Sunday, please make sure... Uh, you go right onto our website, and you can uh, stay right along with the with the sermon, with the the whole service, and it's a great I'd like blessing. To, I'd like to add that Mr. Joe Willis came up at four to five hours while we're for cleanup, and they took so I don't go up there, and they put it on the TV down there, and it was fantastic. Hmm. And I thank God that I Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Yes, ma'am, Miss Faria. 
I'm thankful for my family and friends and for this church family that helps me grow in Christ. Amen. And I would also like to do the hymn 262. 262. 262. There is power in the blood. We can do that one. Let's do 262. There's power in the blood. Let's sing on that first. <laughs> testimonies. Adults, I know you got some here. I know I've been seeing some things the Lord has been doing. Mama up front here. I'm on a trip and we're up on a country road headed to uh, Kentucky and we were behind a farmer pulling a very long trailer behind him and uh, the road was narrow and my great and wonderful captain here is a great driver and so he was pulling out he pulled out to pass and there was nowhere to go on either side and all of a sudden up ahead coming up over a hill is a guy driving very fast and so we're all praying you know lord help us because there was nowhere to go for him, nor us, nor the farmer, but God was good, and he just, he just brought Paul Paul right around and put him right in front of the tractor, and uh, we were all safe, so Amen. we just praise the Lord for his goodness. Praise the Lord for that. Got to watch out for those Kentucky drivers. They're a little strange out that way, so. Anyone else here? Samantha? I'm thankful for my family and everything that God blessed me with. Amen. Amen. Miss Liberty. I praise God that we've been able to get um, a bunch of the predators that have been killing our little creatures that we have. Um, so far, nine nights we've got nine coons and three possums so i'm going to keep setting those traps <laughs> there you go hey possum doesn't taste too bad if it's in with a bunch of vegetables so you know miss anna i want to praise the lord for um, giving my niece a safety travel for 19 hours flight though she um she lost her cell phone in san francisco and all her memories is there. So, well, we praise so that we are able to spend time with her. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Brother Doug. I'm thankful for uh, God 
giving me a new job and getting me through the CDL process completely. And uh, I appreciate everyone's prayers. And it's been quite the summer. But uh, I'm thankful that God is good. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Ms. Jenny. thankful that Grant is feeling better and could come to church tonight. It makes me happy. Amen. And um, I'm also thankful for um, our church family and our pastor and our youth pastor and Pastor Lucas and um, th th your desire to teach us God's word and our children. Amen. Anyone else? Ma'am. Just one of him, okay. 514. 514, in number 514. He's a wonderful savior to me. Yes, he is. Let's lean on this first verse here. <laughs> going on. We do have a lot of folks that work in other areas all morning long, and this is your service for the week. And uh, we want to make sure you know about these things. So um, these announcements we have for you, you mark your calendar. Uh, if you want to go to the Ladies Conference in South Haven Baptist Church in Springfield coming up September 15th, please go ahead and register online. And the discount will end August 18th. You can get $10 off. We'd love for all of our ladies to go, whether you're a member or not have a great fellowship there for a one-day conference and also the new in the bulletin we have the other ladies conference which is out of town for three days November 1st 2nd and 3rd and they are going to be charged up they're going to get all kinds of spiritual focus and have a blast and they'll come back Saturday afternoon and revival with uh, brother Barry Webb starts that Sunday uh, so they'll be going all the way Sunday through Friday with that one so the ladies' celebration is out of town at Camp of the Pines, November 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. And we hope that you men can work it out to let your wife be able to take the time off to go. Make arrangements for child care and uh, everything else uh, that they can go and have that time of relaxation and spiritual refreshment and recharge. Okay, um, we have a church business meeting next Sunday night, a quarterly meeting. And I think that's it. Now, we mentioned that the kids will be having their music program start next week and the bell choir. So parents, please go, go ahead and take the, the form that's on the back counter. Read over that. If you have any questions, see Miss Becky. And um, oh, she can get you all the information you need because it's not just a program for the kids where they're going to come and, and sing and so forth. That's one thing. But to be a member of the bell choir, it's kind of like a class. And so you need to register and check in with her so they can really take a part and work on that okay all right we'll go ahead and have our men come at this time aren't you glad that we have this opportunity to be a halar giver amen if you weren't here this morning we studied what it means to be a halar giver and that is always identifying back to the source 
from which it came. And uh, not just meaning hilarious, but we are a cheerful giver, always pointing back, God, you've been so good to me. You're the source. Okay. Will you give thanks, Joel? Let's sing When I Survey the Wonders Cross, and then we'll go to our, uh, to our message here for tonight. You can stay seated for this one. Let's start on that first verse. as he gives this whole story here. Here's the response to the sacrifice that God gave. As we're singing this, this fourth verse, I encourage you, think about that word. Sing it from your heart. On the four, we're the whole realm of nature mine. We're the whole realm. Turn to the book of Ezra tonight. Ezra. 
Well, school has started back, and folks are in their science classes, and they sometime, Lord willing, will be able to come across the information where you learn about one of the most brilliant minds that mankind has ever, ever seen. One of the also very spiritual, godly minds, truly blessed of God, was Sir Isaac Newton. And he was the one who was articulated for us and put into an understanding the uh, whole law of gravity. And always people, people always put a picture of him sitting under the apple tree and having the apple fall and hit him on the head. And he goes, oh, that must be gravity. Uh, a little bit more complicated than that. Sir Isaac Newton was such a brilliant man that when he wanted to teach his pupils the things that... He, he knew and was going on in his mind, they couldn't understand him because he was on an entirely different level of thinking. I don't know what his IQ was, but it was exceedingly much higher than ours today. And Sir Isaac Newton realized he needed to develop a language in which if he could teach his students to learn that language, he could communicate to them all of his brilliant thoughts. And so, Sir Isaac Newton developed what we call today calculus. And most of us are scared to even think of that type of mathematics. But his brain automatically thought it, and he came up with it. One of his most famous quotes that he is known to have said is that if we have seen further, it is because we are standing on the backs of giants. And what he meant by that was, Oh, I don't want the glory and the credit for being able to further science than it ever has gone before. All of the glory and praise goes to those who have come before me, those giants. And I'm only learning what they learned and seeing just a little bit further. It is a wonderful thing to be able to have great men with you. It's a wonderful thing to have the family or co-laborers or those around you that can help you see further to accomplish greater things. Having men at your side and supporting you, you just have to thank God for. But even greater than having the resource of mankind is having the unmeasurable blessing of having God's hand upon you. In the book of Ezra, we find that God has a good hand. When you have God's good hand supporting you, upon you, helping you, the world is yet to see what can be done. And in the book of Ezra, we see a miraculous event that takes place. Let me back up for you in history and show you where was Israel at this time of Ezra. Israel was not in its heyday. It was not in the day of glory. It actually had been in captivity, in subjugation to a foreign power, and all the wisest of the wise and all the, those that could contribute to society were all taken back and were living in captivity in Babylon. Seventy years of captivity had transpired. And now a group of Israelites, some nearly 50,000, were ready to trek their way back. They had gotten permission from the king, and they were going to head back to Jerusalem, and there they were going to rebuild the temple that had been destroyed. God needed a place to be worshipped. The only problem was it was 900 miles. It was a journey in which you needed to care for women and children. They, they were putting themselves out there where they could be subject to bandits and thieves. They were carrying with them all kinds of wealth that had been donated to rebuild the temple. The journey was great. Many of them had never seen this, this path before. You think about it. If the, they had been in captivity for 70 years, those going back that knew the way were probably exceedingly old, so they were exceedingly few. Most everybody else was either 
uh, very born there and raised up there in Babylon and, and didn't even know what Jerusalem looked like. And this group of ragtag individuals was going to trek their way across the desert. The journey was great. There were many adversaries. And ultimately, God's glory was at stake. In Ezra, I want you to see a few verses here in chapter 7, verse 6. Ezra chapter 7. The Bible says, And Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready, that means a very skilled scribe, in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given, and the Lord and the king granted him all the request according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. He got his request. Can we go back? Sure, you can go back. Can we take up an offering? Can, and will you donate? Sure. And so all the money was given. But how is it that God's glory was at stake? Look at chapter 8 and verse 21. A few pages over. Chapter 8, verse 21. Before he left, notice in verse 21, I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of Him a right way for us. We needed God's direction and guidance and for our little ones and for all our substance, for all the money that we were carrying. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way. Why, Why did he turn down the opportunity to ask the king for soldiers to accompany them? I mean, if you're going to make that journey... You would want to have protection. Nobody in their right mind is going to go across the desert where there's thieves and robbers that would very quickly kill you to take what you have. And, and here you were with a, not just a group of men, but you had the women and the children, and it was a dangerous situation. Why did he not ask? Because Ezra had been preaching and proclaiming and really bragging up on how good God was, and the king of Babylon knew it. He was saying, you know, my God, my King, He takes care of us no matter what. When we're poor and needy, my God will provide. If we need protection, God will provide. And he had preached that so much that everybody knew that Ezra had a conviction that God would provide. And so when the king said, yes, you may go back, he realized something. Where was his faith? The unsaved world around him would laugh and mock him and blaspheme the name of God. If, Oh, yeah, sure, your God's going to provide, but yeah, you're asking the king for soldiers. And so God laid a conviction on his heart to make this journey without any protection. Notice we read on in verse 22. I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them, for good, that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. I want to have God's good hand on me and on us as a church. I do. I want that every single one of us are prospered and blessed according to the desires of your heart. And as you want to seek God's will, I pray that God would do God's will in your life. And that He would hold back Satan, hold back problems, that God would bless you, His good hand upon you, that those adversaries that are ready to attack you and tear you down, that God just pushes them out of the way. I want God's glory and His hand to be upon you. I want to be able to brag and say, God provides these people trusted God, and God answered. I want to see that for you. But how do you get, what do you have to do to get God's goodness? How do you arrive where God puts His good hand on you? Because a lot of times, God doesn't put good hand, His good hand on even His own children. He loves, He provides, He protects, but 
Sometimes we desperately need, and I think that a time like this right now, we desperately need God's good hand on our lives. Let's pray. Father, we ask you that you would show us from your word these few moments here how we can have God's good hand of blessing upon us. Help me, Lord, to be able to share this short message. Be with these folks that are here tonight, and I thank you for their testimonies, their praises. I thank you for their sincere desire to be here and hungering for your word. I thank you that they have, some have driven a long distance, and, and the Father, I thank you for all those who uh, have sacrificed and consecrated their lives to an extra hour of meeting with you and the church family. I pray, God, that you would minister and bless, and may we see from your word tonight what it means to have your good hand upon us. I ask for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take the book of Ezra tonight and see just a couple quick pointers. How can we get God's good hand upon us? What did Ezra do? Look with me in a few verses here. Look at chapter 8, verse 21, the verses we just read. Of course, we have to start with the most important thing that we always start with. Whenever we want something from God, we have to meet with Him and we talk with Him. How? In prayer. It says, I, uh, I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our, our God. Now, as you read through the Bible, and every time the Bible talks about a fast, it means to afflict yourself. And so there are all kinds of times that I fast. I fast every night. And, and, and in the morning, I break that fast. Okay, that, I just do. I don't eat all night long, okay? I have afflicted myself. And there are some times when I know one sweet lady, she... Uh, she used to go to church here, and she would say, I'm taking a fast on chocolate. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, how in the world can you do that? I don't think I could ever do that. I live on chocolate. Oh, my goodness. One of the first cartoons my son ever made for me, he drew a little cartoon, and he put Dad. And it was a Father's Day card, and he, he drew a picture of this guy that had his mouth open and yelling ah, like that. And it said, help, I'm out of chocolate. Happy Father's Day afflicting yourself, you have to find an area of your life that you can afflict yourself with. For most of us, it's going without food. And so that's synonymous with us as far as fasting. But other times you can fast from other things, right? I know some people that fast from watching sports. Oh my goodness, how can they do that? Because they found it to be a problem in their life that was a distraction. And there are many distractions in life. You can say, you know what? I'm not going to read as many books. Whoa, don't you encourage reading? Yes, but if that is becoming priority, maybe you should spend the time reading the Bible and turning down other things. This is what fasting is. In. And he wanted, Ezra wanted all the people to have their hearts directed. And so how do you get God's good hand upon you? You start with some serious prayer. And in serious prayer, before we ever ask, there's the process where we get our hearts right with God. There was a great man of God who was famous for praying. His name was, nickname became Praying Hyde. Across Christendom, many people knew that this great man of God was known for connecting with God. And one time a man said, can I pray with you today? And Praying Hyde said, sure, come along with me. And they went into the prayer closet and knelt down. And the man thought, I can't wait. I can't wait to hear the great things that praying Hyde is going to, this is going to be a once in a lifetime experience to hear this man pray to God who has his world known to connect with God. God hears and answers this man's prayers. I'm here. And he said they knelt down there and he anticipation listened, what's he going to say? And praying Hyde was silent. And after about five or ten minutes it expired, all of a sudden, praying Hyde broke the silence and began to make noises, and he just went, Oh, God. And then continued for another five or ten minutes in silence before he ever began to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
That is the heart preparation before we ever ask for anything. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us of our trespasses. But we have to connect with God. And Ezra knew that. Ezra knew that the people needed to get their hearts in tune with God. And so he declared this fast where they cleared out all the distractions of life and said, we are going to purpose to hear from God. So how do you get God's good hand? It obviously starts with prayer. But secondly, it's preparation of the heart. And you're in chapter, uh, in Ezra, turn to chapter 7, and I want you to look at two verses. Ezra chapter 7 and verse 9. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon. So they set out on their journey, and on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem. They made it. It took them exactly four months. According to Hebrew timekeeping, their months were all the same. There was 30 days. There was no 20, 29 or 30 or 31. It was always 30. And so they had calculations to equal out 365 and a quarter days. They had all that that they had uh, calculated. But 120-day journey through the desert, 900 miles. They made it. And God answered their prayer. And they didn't need the protection of the king, and, and not a penny was stolen, and not a person was harmed. God answered their prayer. But there was another thing that they had done. And it's something that you and I need to do in our lives as well. It says, they made it on the first day of the fifth month, came he to Jerusalem, according to the good hand of his God upon him. Why? Because, look at verse 10 and underline this, Ezra had prepared his heart. He didn't prepare his arms and work out and develop skills and strength for fighting. He didn't, he didn't protect the men and go, have them all go into training about how they could take on the enemy and, and have self-defense. No, he, he prepared his heart. What does it mean to prepare your heart? Obviously, you pray, but you prepare your heart. God's good hand will come upon us as a church if we are people of prayer and the people that prepare our hearts. So how do you prepare your heart? The word prepare there means you set it. So how many of you, I don't have my phone with me, um, but you would set your clock. A couple of years ago, I read this, this uh, statistic. Someone said uh, they'd done a study, and that there's a certain number of people sleep with their phone. And I was like, what? Sleeping with your phone? That's ridiculous. And now I do. I don't sleep with it and love it. <laughs> no, I, I put it right where I can reach it, and it is my alarm clock. And so if I want to get up early and not oversleep, then what do I do? I set my phone, and it has a nice, gentle, quiet song that comes on, a bird singing. And uh, Pastor Matt, what's yours? You said you did not like annoying ones. You liked those that were nice and good morning, Matt. You don't like any of them. <laughs> there you go. And this is not good. I had some that were like a foghorn. <laughs> you know, what's really good is if you can develop a pattern where you don't have to have an alarm. Is there anyone like that? You just, you can wake up the same time every day. Carmelo, army life, right? You, you wake, you hear it in your head. Duh. <laughs> Duh, da, 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 da. <laughs> you hear reveille? Is there anyone else like that? Okay, if you, if you break out of that, it, you can get back on. It doesn't take too, too long, but your body can naturally wake up, and I usually wake up about two or three minutes before my alarm goes off. It just does. Unless I have to, if I'm finally finished packing for a trip, and, you know, it's 1 o'clock, and you're like, man, i got to get to bed, and you're setting the clock for 4, and, you know, you're only going to get three hours, but you need those three hours because you're going to drive. Those are the worst nights because I never sleep. And I'm like, I'm going to wake up late. I'm going to wake up late. I'm going to wake up late. And I don't trust my phone. So I, I have my phone. If you set it and believe it and trust it, it's going to wake you up. That's the same idea what it means to prepare your heart. You set it. That means you have a disciplined, dedicated conviction in your heart. I will get up and read my Bible, and pray. That's it. 
You set not just your clock, you set your heart. Now, why does God use the word heart? Because in the Old Testament, God told Moses this. And Jesus Christ told us in, in the New Testament era, he, they told us to love the Lord God with what? All of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Every part of our being is to love God. And so how does my heart? You know, my heart is the very first one on the top of that list, you know, because my heart is the first one to go astray. My heart represents my affections. I like this. I like that. I love the chocolate chip cookies and the M&Ms. I love that. I have to prepare my heart, meaning I set my heart and I will determine my affections that I can't go here. I can't go there. I will not do this. I will not do that. I have convictions to keep my heart pure. If I don't, then I'll be messing up. And so out of the heart are the issues of life. So you have to prepare your heart. The Puritans in the 1600s were very fond of saying this. It's a great quote. Write it down. And it's, so, it's such a, a beautiful phrase. The heart of the matter in the Christian life is the matter of the heart. When it all comes down to it, the whole core of your problem, the very center of the problem that you're experiencing is a heart issue. Where's your heart? And in counseling, someone's going through a horrible situation and life is all messed up and it's exceedingly complex. You'll find that if you follow God, nothing is complex. Sir Isaac Newton, this brilliant mind, he basically has another famous quote, and I can't quote it verbatim because I don't have a brilliant mind, but he said this, everything that God created is simple and not complex. Wow. Wow. And the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And our problems all come back to our heart. Our heart gets drawn away. Don't follow your heart. That's the worst advice in the world. Follow God's word. And so prepare your heart. Set your heart. Have those internal convictions. And then he goes on to explain to us what it means to prepare your heart. Very simply here, three points from one verse. Pastor, you said it was going to be a short message. Hey, it is. One verse. For Ezra had prepared, verse 10, his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Three things about preparing your heart. First of all, number one, is to seek God's Word. You need to set your heart to wake up and read God's Word. To read God's Word. Because we desperately need it. The psalmist said that God's word is more precious than gold. So, if I told you and showed up at your house with a document and I'd say, folks, hey, this came across and I checked it out from a survey and uh, I went on the city and county records and here's this, this legal document here. And did you know there is a a large, very large gold deposit buried in this? I I was really, really surprised when I found it is in your neighborhood where you live. And uh, upon closer inspection, I noticed that it is buried in your backyard. And this is the proof right here. And we're, I'm not just speculating. This is guaranteed proof. And I laid it before you, and you were like, no way, no way, no way. And you just didn't believe me. And you just said, forget it. And you went on the rest of your life in poverty, not even knowing that there was all of that gold in your backyard, not even believing that there was. And it was just buried. You didn't see it. I don't believe anything I, don't, I can't see. Well, the truth of the matter is there's all this gold in your backyard, and here's the proof. So by faith you believe. What would you do if you believed? What's to be the first thing you do? I try not to break my leg running down the stairs to get my shovel. My shovel, the one that's so old, it's now got a moon shape on the end from hitting so much hard ground and concrete. And I'd start digging. 
and I'd start in this corner, and I'd start on earth in the backyard, and who cares about lawns? Who cares about grass? I would be digging and digging and digging, and I would make my way across because I don't know exactly where it is, but I know it's in my backyard, and I'm going to dig until I wear myself out. And I'm going to be drinking water, and I'm going to get stinky sweaty. I'm going to get dirty. I could care less about what people think of me. I'm going to dig because the gold is there, much gold. And when my shovel wears out, what am I going to do? I'm going to be hollering to Kim, throw me a big serving spoon. I'm getting on my hands and knees because I really believe the gold is there. Why don't we do that when God tells us that there is something far greater than earthly gold which perishes? But there's an eternal riches that's found much sweeter than honey, that's better than gold. And it's right there in your possession. To seek. Do we seek God? This is our challenge, friends. This is my challenge. Do we seek God in His Word like we should? Do we hunger and thirst and dig like crazy and not care what anybody thinks? We're going to get out there and we're going to dig. I don't care if they laugh at me and mock me and think I'm too spiritual. And you know, Some of you are going off to, to Christian college, and I pointed out Chris, but you know, Carissa's here and she's heading back this week, and Pollock and a bunch of others, they're all heading out of here. Kristen, where are you? Headed back, excited, going away. You know, even at a Christian college, people can think you're overdoing it spiritually. I don't care. I'm, I'm, I'm going to dig. That's what he means here. He says, he prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. But number two, it's one thing to know it and to, to, to read it. It's a whole other thing to do what? To do it. One time, I was so overwhelmed with what God expected in our lives. Was that an amen? Okay, I can good for another 15 minutes. <laughs> I was so overwhelmed learning so much about what God expected of His faithful. And I wanted to be faithful, and I wanted to, to give my life to the Lord. That I almost, I, I, in my prayer, in my meditation, I just said, God, I don't want to know anymore because I can't live up to what I know. Have you ever been there? We, we continue to learn God's Word. We continue, to see, we continue to hear the Holy Spirit prompting us to stop doing things and to start doing more things. And we, we wrestle and fight with the Holy Spirit because we have our heart in the wrong place. But we've got to dig more. We've got to seek God more. And we need to start doing what we know. I, I was joking with someone here in the church about something, and they, boy, they got me mm, perfectly. And I went, touche. Oh, because all they said was, for him, he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. I was like, oh, why did I point out that I should have done something and I didn't do it, so they convicted me about it. For he that knows to do good and does it not, that's sin. Wow. We know what we're supposed to do. And, and Ezra said, we're not only going to learn it, we're going to do it. But the third thing is what? Verse 10. And to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. You know, there's just something about teaching. I don't have the statistic in front of me. I think Christy Willis put this on Facebook this week about, uh, or maybe it wasn't her, it was someone else that, that did something about teaching and education. And, and I always like those things. But it said, we remember 10% of what we hear. We remember 20% of what we hear and uh, practice or something. We remember 30% and went down through and, it's, and it said, you know, we remember 50% of what we, what we hear and do. And if you're a good educator, you know that. You know that if you can have them do practice sets and actually learn and do things, they remember and retain so much more if there's a, a hands-on practice set that's involved. And that's true. But the statistic, I don't know if it's foundational or, or proven, but I, I, I pretty much know from my own experience we remember 90% of what we hear, do, and teach. And folks, I had to teach Greek. Now, I had taken Greek. I was a Greek minor. I should know it pretty well. 
But you know, after several years and a lot of classes in Greek and taking Hebrew, you, all, you know it, but you, do, you don't know it, you know. And all of a sudden, I got my teaching assignment in the college, and I'd been out from the Greek for a couple years at the time. I had taught in the high school, and then they took me and said, we want you to teach freshmen over in the college, and then the second year, we want, we want to teach you freshmen and sophomores, and that's when they started taking Greek, and we want you to teach Greek. It had been like four years. I was a little rusty. You know what? After teaching it and then doing it the second year, I only taught three years before I left the college, but I, I taught it for three years. You know what was really neat? I still to this day write half of my vowels when I'm writing fast. I write English and Greek letters all in the same word. I just trans transpose, transliterate. I just do because it's faster. I knew that if you can take your Bible and read, I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel and of his uh, priests and Levites in my realm, which are, you can read upside down, can't you? You could hold this up in a mirror and you can read backwards. Isn't your mind amazing? And I realized that if I can do that in English without even thinking, wouldn't it be a good challenge if I could do that with Greek? And so I set out and challenged myself. And when I did my, my lesson preparation, I would take my Greek New Testament and I'd turn it upside down. And I would read it upside down, practicing, learning. And then I said, if I can do that, why can't I do it backwards? So I began to write all of my lessons in Greek. I would take, and I would still use my dominant hand, and I would write the letters, the words backwards. And I could read them. And it was a challenge, and it was an exercise. And then I went in and I taught the Greek class. Because you can't be less than your students. You have to have the edge on them. And little did they know I was only one page ahead of them. <laughs> but I was one page ahead, one lesson ahead, because it was rusty. And I was learning and working really hard. Do you know what? When you teach something, you got it. Why is it that most Christians hear and hear and hear over and over and they don't get it because they're not doing the Word of God? And even yet, Ezra said, it's another step to be teaching. Well, pastor, we all can't be teachers. You can because God makes it a really broad category and He says, if you will share the Word of God with your family, you're a teacher. If you can share God's word with a coworker, if you can share God's word, you become a teacher. And there are more resources today to be able to take a little book, a discipleship book that's really elementary, and we use it here in our church, and it's fill in the blank. And we have someone in discipleship, they can work on that, and they can look up the verse, and they fill in the blank. It's so simple, and you can become a teacher, and once you have taught the lesson, you've got it. It is so important for us to become teachers, and teachers' assistants, and helpers, and working with one another, and educating our entire church family and body of Christ to be closer to God and knowing His Word. One of the most memorable things in my life that transformed me and stopped me in my tracks when I saw it and is indelibly printed in my brain. It was one day I was, I was working in the woods for six summers and Christmas breaks and every other day off I, I worked as a, as a logger in the woods. And, and it's hard work, but, you know, we took a few days off now and then when it was pouring rain. It just, it's just miserable working in the woods in the rain. Because you go to cut a tree down, and that tree is just saturated with thousands of gallons of water. And so what I, I tried to do is I'd tr drive the logging skidder up, and I would and I'd drop the blade down, and I'd go up there and just bump the tree and back up, and just all the water would come down. And then my dad would cut the trees down and start limbing them out. But still, there's just rain, and you're just like a wet rat. You're miserable. You're up to your, above your calves, almost to your knees in mud, slopping around, and it's just no fun. So we would take a break and say, let's go do something else. So we would go home, 
And uh, one day he said, let's go visit a friend who owns a mill 40 minutes away. So we went down to his mill. At this mill, they would take hardwood and turn them into dowels. And from those dowels, they could, be, they could make just about anything. A lot of wooden handled devices that used to be very popular now all are plastic, but kitchen appliances and everything was wood. So we went to this mill and we finally we got there right about the time the whistle had blown and people were stopping and all the machines shut down and, and everybody had gone on lunch break. We walked into the mill and there was this young man all sweaty and dirty and he was covered with sawdust that was stuck to his body all over him and his hair was all messed up and he was seated, he was seated on the hard concrete floor with his back against the wall and he had an open lunch pail and from which he was, he was pouring his coffee and it was a young man, I, I don't know, 20 and he is opening up a sandwich and he, with one hand he was eating and the other hand he had his Bible open. Folks, that changed my life. Because in that I saw a young man who was not a pastor. He was not going off to Bible college to be a preacher. He was a laborer in a normal workplace. By the way, you want to get around some rough crowds? I imagine there's some rough crowds in New York City, Brooklyn, right? I imagine there's rough crowds in some of the places you've had to work. And let me tell you this. When I worked in the logging I would do logging in the day, and then I would work in the mill at nights, trying to save up money to get through college. There are some really rough people that will be very quick to make every, take every opportunity to make fun of the Christians. There would be people that would deck you out, knock your lights out, and punch you out, shove you, make you fun, and they would throw filth and trash in front of your eyes and, and, and just say, hey there, Christian, you know, church, uh, Chucky Church boy. Try to tell dirty things and get you to do bad things in a constant environment like that. And I saw this young man in that bad environment who unashamedly had such a hunger and thirst for the things of God that he didn't care what anybody said, but he sat right down as soon as he could, plopped down, and while he was eating, he was reading God's Word. He set his heart to do that. He was going to do it, and he was going to teach it to someone else. Oh, how accountable we are before God because we have been given so much. And God expects us to turn around and give that to others. How do we get God's good hand upon us as a church? How, do we, how can we say this journey of life that we're taking that we're muddling our way through. It's a long, laborious time, 120 days, 900 miles in fear and trembling, and I don't know the way, and I don't know where we're going to end up, but we're trusting God. This journey that we're on, we desperately need God's good hand on us, don't we, to make it, to get through, and praise God. How do we do? How do we get God's good hand? He tells us in verse 10. Underline it, meditate on it. We prepare our hearts. We pray and we prepare our hearts to set them to follow, to seek the Lord. To seek the Lord, to do it, and to teach it. I would love for God's good hand to be on us. I, I have a burden for God to raise up a bus ministry here at our church. I drive through town and I see so many people and little children and I want to I want to bring them into church. I want to teach them. I want you to teach them. There's souls that are it's white under harvest. People all around us. And I'm not only burdened for the children, I'm, I'm, I'm a burden for all these people that you see everywhere. There's no hope in their life. There's no joy. They're miserable and you know that they're on their way to hell. They have not Christ. We need to teach them. We need to reach them. We need to give them God's word. We have a huge, huge journey ahead of us as a church. How do we do it? We need God's good hand on us, don't we? We as a church need to be setting our heart to seek the Lord, to do God's word, 
and to teach others. I would love to see God raise up more ministries. We need our Bible Institute going and thriving again. We need to train more people to be able to be better equipped to be disciplers. And, you know, we, we have so many opportunities. There are so many families that visit our church, and Kim and I try to follow up, and we try to get others involved in following up. And, and you know, we live in a day and age where people will go to church once a year or twice a year, and they, they visit the church and never go anywhere else. They just go home, and they have no desire. You know, they need Christ. We need an army of people. And I, I think if Ezra was all alone in this, it would have been greatly discouraging, but God answered his prayer. And as we close, I want you to show you to this verse. Turn to 7, chapter 7, verse 28. He is praising God as we close. He's praising God, and he says in verse 27, Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, which hath put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. I praise God that God turned the heart of the king, as he's saying, and I praise God that he has extended mercy unto me before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty princes. And, notice this, I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. And I gathered together out of, all, uh, out of Israel chief men to go up with me. Ezra says, I was strengthened in my faith. I wasn't weak in my faith because I trusted God and he was good to me and he provided for me and he answered my prayer. And when I saw God doing that, I was encouraged. I was strengthened that God can use me. Look at chapter 8, verse 18. Chapter 8. And by the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of understanding of the sons of Mali, the son of Levi, the son of Israel, and Sherebiah with his sons and his brethren, 18. And Hashabiah and with him, Jeshiah and the sons of Merari, his brethren and their sons, 20. I got 18 great wise people, and I got 20 more from over here, and also of the Nethanims, whom David and the princes had appointed for the service of the Levites. 220 Nethanims, all of them were expressed by name. God was so good to me, he provided all the people that we needed to go over and be effective. Kim and I were talking today about um, church planting and the most successful pattern of church planting. And, and we're, we're basically becoming more and more convinced that it's, it's a struggle and it is very difficult to do church planting when you're all alone. It is far more effective if God's good hand would be upon us to provide for us the Nethanims the Levites, and all these people. And with this 18 from here and 20 from there, God's good hand provides the men and women to do God's work. I view Cross and Crown Baptist Church right now as a church plant because I have so much vision of what God can do in Clarksville. And folks, here's my plea. Let's dedicate ourselves to set our hearts, to seek the Lord, to do his word and to teach. And I believe that God will raise up a great church here for his glory. And he has provided us each other as that team of laborers to go forward and reach Clarksville for Christ. We can do this. Will you join me? Will you join me in this effort? Because we need a bigger building and we're building it by faith. But it's, it's going to cost way more than we can afford, so we need God's good hand upon us, don't we? We need God's good hand. It's going to involve the 501c3. It's going to involve the plans being done. It's going to involve the money. We're going to need all these things which we do not have. And so let's proclaim a fast where we get our hearts right with the Lord and let's set our hearts and labor together. And we need teachers. We went through the list of all of those spots and places where we need workers. And we are running at about 40% capacity, meaning of all the teachers and laborers and helpers we need for all of our ministries this fall, we've only got about 40% slotted and we're empty 60%. So we need to pray. Would you join with me? I can't wait to see what God does with his good hand upon you and also with his good hand upon us.
let's make it a serious matter of prayer this next week or two that we can see God take our church to the next level. Let's pray. Father, help us to set our heart to seek you. We owe our lives to you, and I pray that you would help us. Here we are tonight, small in number, and few in the eyes of man. But there is more help with us. There's more that be with us than be with them. And God, we pray that you would have your good hand upon us. Lord, that you would raise up a great host of laborers to do your work in every area, whether it be cleaning, helping, assisting, teaching, driving. God, that you would help us to reach Clarksville for you. God, the, the field is white into harvest, both on the mission field and in the uttermost part of the earth, but it's also white into harvest right here in this city. Father, we need your help. God, the journey is long, it is difficult, it is fraught with danger, challenges, and adversaries. And so we trust you, God, and I pray and ask you that you would help us as a people to pray and fast and that we would afflict our souls, that we might begin to set our heart the right way. We're so prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, so prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. God, I ask you that you would help us as a church to truly commit ourselves to your mission that you've called us to. We pray for your blessing. We love you, Lord. May your blessing be upon every single person here and those listening. And Father, whatever your will is for their life, I pray that it would find your hand upon them as they follow your leading. We pray that you bless. In Jesus' name.